Oh, and welcome to another fully live Wednesday Q&A episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have my good friend and fellow hacker, Alex, here to talk about, well, whatever your cybersecurity related questions are. Unfortunately, our producer, Michael, is not on the stream today, so if you have cryptozoology related questions, please hold those until the next stream where he will probably be our special guest. Alex, thanks for joining us today. Of course. It's good to be here. So uh, lots of stuff to go over today. First up, what have you been working on, Alex? A lot of stuff. Um, I was busy all the way up until like five minutes ago, so I didn't have enough time to actually pull up lots of the cool stuff that I wanted to show off. But the most recent thing that I've been working on, I've been dabbling in a lot of war driving related projects recently, but the most recent proof of concept that I've been developing um, is this project called DNS Drive-By, which is something that you ideated um, We've been talking about this for probably like two years, years now. I yeah, think. yeah, years. Yeah. So the concept behind this is um, using open Wi-Fi networks that are around you. If you're like war driving or something like that, um, you can have a device like maybe a Raspberry Pi, or in this case, my implementation uses a three-dollar Wi-Fi microcontroller called the ESP eighty-two sixty-six um, to automatically join open Wi-Fi networks it sees while you're traveling around, gathering war driving data, sniffing Wi-Fi traffic, or stuff like that automatically connect to open Wi-Fi networks and then use those as essentially a vector for um, data exfiltration. So this is really useful because if you wanted to create something like a GPS tracker, which I'm creating for an upcoming episode, um, this doesn't require like an LTE connection or a SIM card or anything traceable like that. This uses entirely open Wi-Fi networks um, and something called a DNS request um, in order to basically send me semi real-time location data. So the way this works basically is if there's like an open network nearby, like Starbucks Wi-Fi or like some other cafe, um, typically when you try to connect to those networks, you'll be hit with like a captive portal, login page, or that kind of thing. Oftentimes though, these open networks don't have complete firewall rules set up. So while you won't be able to browse like web traffic, um, certain things are allowed to slip through. One of these things being DNS requests. So this proof of concept basically leverages the fact that you can still create DNS requests, even though you might not be able to like fully connect to an open network while passing by it. Stuff a whole bunch of data, in this case, GPS coordinates, date, time, location, Wi-Fi networks and stuff like that in a DNS request and then send that back to my server um, where basically I can have like a GPS tracker that's sitting on somebody's car and this will automatically send me their location data using just open Wi-Fi networks that um, they pass by through a dense area. So to sum it up in like 10 seconds, this is a GPS tracker that purely relies on open Wi-Fi networks and DNS smuggling in order to avoid using like an LTE module, right? Basically, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I also created a hardware prototype for it that we might be um, showing off in a video soon. This is a little case that I made for it. Um, okay. If you wanna switch over to my screen, you can see a little model for that. I've been messing around with different form factors and sizes for it. The one that I have here is a little bit bigger. It fits like a standard D1 mini uh, kind of module. So it has like micro USB. You can slap on like a LiPo charger, stuff like that. It's a little bit bigger. The one that I have on screen um, is gonna be about a quarter or maybe half the size. So this is gonna use an ESP01 module. It's real tiny um, and a lot more discreet. But yeah, that's mostly what I've been messing around with this week. Yeah, so the reason that Alex has been working on that also is because we are filming an episode where we get to track our very elusive and mysterious friend Irish as he goes about his day. Um, we've kind of defined an area where we're going to be doing, doing the tracking, and Alex is making his own prototype for tracking, whereas I am using just some hacker tools and my knowledge of Wi-Fi in order to track Irish around as he goes. So uh, in this case, I'm going to be using just a um, pretty simple command. If we switch over to my screen, you can see that on the Wi-Fi Coconut, which is a new Hack5 product that has 14 different radios and allows you to capture basically on all 2.4 gigahertz channels simultaneously. Um, this allows you to, just by running this one command in a terminal window on Mac OS, of course, if you have T Shark installed, uh, to target any SSID you want, as you can see right here, and search for a phone that is beaconing this out. Now, why is that important? Well, my method of tracking <clears throat> involves having somebody scan a QR code. And once they scan that QR code, their phone will add this Wi-Fi network that I'm looking for to their trusted network list, but as a hidden network. And that means their phone is going to be beaconing out the name of this network all the time, looking for it and trying to find out if it's nearby. 
And that's what I'm going to be using to track our friend Irish. So I'm going to be using this one liner, which is it's a very long one liner, but it automatically starts up the Wi Fi coconut, it connects it to T shark, and then <clears throat> it applies a capture filter where it will not show anything except probe requests that are looking for the specific target SSID. So if you're looking for a specific SSID, like a specific network that someone's connected to in the past, this is also a really good filter if you wanted to try it out with the Wi-Fi coconut. I just found it to be a helpful little one-liner that I'm using to basically like stick a coconut to the top of my car and then drive around and wait until I get a signal from Irish's phone after tricking him into scanning one of these uh, QR codes. So a little bit of a fun Wi-Fi attack on my account because I think that people often ask if it's a good idea to join a hidden Wi-Fi network or make their network hidden. And this is exactly why you should not do that. So it's going to be fun to shoot the rest of that episode. I made a slight modification to that. I don't know if it works quite yet, but we were also trying to get, um, cause for the demo that we were doing, Cody's like driving with a coconut. It's very not safe to be computering while driving. Yeah. Watching so, the screen. Yeah. We made a slight modification to this that also will create like an audible, um, alert that like reads out a custom thing when Iris is detected. Mm. Hopefully this works, but if you guys want to check out that, oh wait, you already have it on your Twitter. Never mind. It's going to point you guys to a GitHub gist, but I made a slight modification to that that should automatically detect if a known network is nearby and then read out something annoying. So I'm going to see if that can play. This is a bash script. Let me start up my test network. Just pretending to be Irish in this case. Oh no, and then my coconut died. So <laughs> it's like that's not gonna be happening. Oh no. Well, <laughs> sad. All right, well, live demos. This is why whenever you do a presentation, I, I always tell you if there's more than a hundred people watching, yeah. can it? Um, but yeah, so we've been working on various tracking techniques and Alex has been helping upgrade mine to be a better mobile tracker because yeah, I don't wanna be like leaning over my computer screen while I'm driving around and trying to find someone. And it was surprisingly hard to actually pipe data out of this. So that's what we've been working on this uh, tracking episode. So stay tuned on Hack5 for that. And uh, with that, we will go ahead and take some questions. Um, although I just got a question right before the stream that I thought was really good. Um, and this was just through Twitter. Uh, so let me show that. So uh, Josh asked, what is the appropriate action when you see personally identifiable information on a company's website and you spent weeks telling them, but they ignore you and just leave it there. Um, so there's two routes you can go um, that would be very, very ethical and standard. And then like, this is your last resort after nothing else is working. And uh, you know, you just have to do something about it. The first and best thing you should do is maybe have a company like Bug Crowd or Hacker One, sorry, Hackeroni, um, do the disclosure for you. Even if you're not gonna get paid, it's a good idea to just have them be the face that tells the company repeatedly they have a problem and that like they need to do something about it, just because um, putting yourself out there individually is never worth it, I would say, in terms of the legal risk and other problems that can come from that. Um, if you have contacted every single person, they've responded to you and they've said, we're not gonna fix this, please stop emailing us. Or otherwise you are 100% sure that you have sent the message and they have received it, that there is a problem and they're just going to ignore it. If you're sure about that, if you're really, really, really sure about that and you feel lucky, you could speak to a journalist perhaps and tell them about the issue. And they would definitely, definitely probably uh, lend some light to that, uh, to that problem. But if you didn't go the full due diligence to try to let that company know, you could probably be sued. I'm not a legal expert, but I would not do it that way. But I have seen other people uh, disclose information that companies are just blatantly ignoring that are putting customers at risk um, to journalists in the past. So. Obviously, the first and best route is disclose to them, make sure that they know and make 100% sure that they know. And if that's not working, you can go through a larger company that might be able to take on that risk for you because, you know, bug disclosure is what they do. They're very experienced at it. I would say um, never make it your personal mission to, uh, to, you know, force this company to do something about it because the legal ramifications, if they really misinterpret what you're doing or if you're too aggressive, are quite severe and you would not want to take them on just by yourself. So that's why, again, working with a, a company that specializes in disclosure is a really good idea for circumstances like this where they're just not replying. All right. Um, Question about the DNS thing that I was talking about. Do I have a DNS server set up to collect the data? No, but I'm using uh, Canary tokens. Ah. So if you want to take a look at this, um, none of this GPS data is going to dox me. Uh, I gathered this at like some random coffee shop. But basically, Canary tokens offers 
like an online honeypot solution where you can create various different types of tokens. In this case, I created um, a DNS token, which is usually used to, you know, see if a hacker is snooping around in your crowd um, and then automatically trigger an alert to this page. Um, but Canary Tokens makes it really easy to try out this form of uh, data exfiltration via DNS requests. Basically, all you have to do, they just dump out a subdomain. It's like a whole bunch of text that you can see up here. It's like custom string .canary -tokens org, And then the data that you want to append or encode, which in my case is GPS data, you just tack that on as another subdomain, encode it to base32. And then you can see it automatically decodes that data on this web page here. So can we can we also just can say see... that we were not the ones that decided to ink base 32 encoded oh, yeah. it? We would have base 64 encoded it. But this is Canary Tokens, not us. So if you're mad about us base 32ing this like I was when I had to find yeah. a base 32 library for CircuitPython, then you know, be mad at be mad at Canary Tokens. But this is a fantastic service. So yeah. But basically you can see here the data that I'm talking about. You have uh, latitude, longitude, date time information. Of course, you can pack other stuff in there as well. I was messing around with a prototype that also exfiltrates Wi-Fi networks. So if you wanted to do like war driving and pinpoint the location of um, like unsecured networks or client devices or stuff like that, you could also upload that to that dashboard. Nice. Um, so I'm gonna, another person asked, did, did you 3D print that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually have another prototype 3D printing as we speak, but completely 3D printed. Uh, I also saw a question about heat inserts. These are using heat inserts, um, although I guess the build cost for that would go up a little bit. I am messing around with a prototype that's also snap fit. So if anyone wants to try to recreate this, um, it's a little bit easier. I think my laptop had a CPU miner. It was a process taking 30% and it was uh, more than my gaming. Closing fixed it, but would always come back on restart. Windows update fixed it. Yeah, I mean, that can be one of two things, either like a memory leak or uh, yeah, something like a, like a miner. I remember we were doing our show one time where we were looking at DNS requests and there was a bunch of like minor, like a coin miner DNS request going out. And that was our first indication that perhaps something might be wrong and we should figure out like what was making those requests like a browser uh, add on or something like that. Because, uh, yeah, that's very sneaky. Um, so, Alex, what trends do you guys see with advanced malware as far as persistence goes? Um, one thing that's interested me a lot is like very, one thing that's been intriguing to me. Um, is stuff that sits like outside of basically like user land, like applications and stuff like that. Specifically, I'm talking about like um, like kernel space uh, kind of stuff, like remote access tools, like rats and things like that. I've been looking into eBPF, which is the extended Berkeley packet filter, which is pretty cool. Um, there seems to be a lot of new research coming out around that. This is it's basically. Um, so the Berkeley packet filter is basically a Linux tool that sits like below. Oh gosh, let me just pull it up. It's hard to describe. It's like a, on your mind? yeah, it's a low level packet filtering system that can be abused um, and has been demonstrated to have been abused by threat actors to make incredibly stealthy backdoors within the last year. Like there've been two that have come out that have been sitting there unknown for a really long time. It was like over five years that these backdoors were sitting there. And because they were using the super low level way of triggering themselves with ma like magic packets, they could be triggered remotely from anywhere. They were super stealthy and they didn't leave the kind of traditional traces that these malicious programs normally would. So that's why like Ber Berkeley packet filter has become a subject of a lot of interest because of the way it's been abused and some very novel and very persistent and sneaky backdoors that have been uncovered lately. So that's why I was actually going to say like Berkeley packet filter stuff has blown my mind in terms of how you can use networking to, you know, be able to remotely trigger or otherwise remotely control a bunch of different hosts just by communicating directly with literally any port with like certain magic numbers. So pretty incredible that you can like take over a machine, maintain persistence, and then like have this hidden presence that's triggered by packets being sent to any port on that computer, all because it's like, kind of like initially parsed by this layer that not a lot of people were really paying attention to. Yeah, I can't find the exact tool that I was thinking of, but this is basically a thing that like sits at like the kernel level um, and allows you to have like observability um, at a very low level, given that like a hacker is able to like compromise your machine and like do a bunch of stuff. This thing can intercept packets before, I think like on layer two or three before it's actually able to like reach any firewalls or that kind of thing. So this is really sneaky and it's also an interesting um, way to implant persistent malware. 
So Adam is asking, um, he wants to pen test his Wi-Fi. Um, he's thinking he wants to do IoT devices. Um, so the, my go-to for pen testing IoT devices um, on a, from a Wi-Fi perspective is usually router exploit. It's specifically made to attack IoT devices, and it has lots of vulnerability scanners built into it that'll allow you to look for super common problems and misconfigurations. Um, so I would say that's probably where I would start just from my, my own tool chest. Like I know that I've managed to find a lot of very surprising like default credentials or like other things that are, again, super common to IoT devices using router exploit, including one at a um, astronomy like observatory that just had like a bunch of like network stuff connected to their guest network that just had default creds. Um, and, you know, just a, a cursory little non-invasive scan uh, was able to turn up a little bit of information about that. So uh, there are some really interesting ways you can use router exploit to explore network devices. And it sounds like it's just for routers, but really it's, it's for IoT devices. And there's a lot of different things you can do that would not even apply to a router built into that tool. So highly recommend router exploit. And I'm sure there's some other IoT like pen testing tools. If you know of any, please shout them out in the chat because I'm actually looking for some more as well. Can a Wi-Fi antenna be soldered to a Raspberry Pi Zero? There's an extra set of pads specifically for a UFL connector. So I have done that before and yeah, it's possible. Do you have to switch a resistor? No. Or cut it? Okay. Um, so typically when you're like adding an antenna to something that has an existing antenna, like in most infrastructure, you have to either like cut something or, or like flip a resistor in order to prevent like both antennas from being connected at the same time, which can cause like degradation issues. So like, I don't know what the status, what the way of doing that with the Raspberry Pi is, but when we get to do that with something like a D1 mini, these often have the ability to add like a antenna to it, but I didn't realize until almost six months into adding antennas that nothing was happening until I went in and actually flipped the little resistor to change too. So that's also a very common thing if you're looking to add an antenna. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right, more questions. Um, Should I grab one from one of the old videos? Oh, uh, there's plenty in the chat too. Um, are there Recommended any? Recommended books. Oh yeah. Ebooks or other guides or things like that for pen testing and hacking. Um, in my experience, I wouldn't necessarily recommend like physical paper books or stuff like that. Just with like how fast tools and techniques and that kind of thing um, are just updated, um, those will kind of go out of date pretty quickly. Honestly, most of the guides that I find are just like random blogs online. Um, there's also a couple really great GitHub repositories that have curated like um, research papers and other like open source documentation and guides and ebooks and that kind of thing. Um, I'll see if I can find one, but honestly, um, not any books off the top of my head. Do you have any? No, I don't read books. I can't read. That's why I make videos. Nice. Um, but I mean, good luck. I, I would say that, uh, you know, there's definitely good publishers. Yeah. I guess like no starch press is a good place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they've been very nice to us. So I know that they're a cool company and they're, you know, very ingrained in the hacker community. So I would say they publish a lot of really great books. I just, again, barely read. So, um, Let's see. Uh, there's some other good questions. Um, Do you have any stickers? Ah, uh, yeah, Damn, that, that was what I was looking stickers. for. Okay, yeah. so here's the deal. If you grab uh, a product up of our website, hackat.com, H-A-K-C-A-T.com, uh, and you indicate in the comments that you were promised a handful of stickers, I will throw in a handful of these hacker stickers, which, by the way, we get them at hacker conferences. We often trade our own stickers with other hackers or like, Otherwise, just like pick up random weird stickers there. So yes, if you if you would like a handful of stickers, I can make that happen. Just you know, grab something off hackad.com and let us know. Nice. Cool. I might hop into some of the old questions that we have. Sure. Go for it. Cool. You want to switch over to my screen? We can check that out. Uh, past Q&A, someone says, we need a video on how to hack CCTV. I don't think we can explicitly show you how to do that, but... Um, Perhaps. Uh, wait. <laughs> so, closed, so closed circuit television is yeah. like, what circuit is it on? Are we talking about like Ethernet? Because like Ethernet stuff like works, and we can do that. And there's a lot of things we can do. But yeah, I don't know about um, <laughs> I don't know about other ones. Michael yeah. said there was a, a question about my cat, but I think it's been buried. Oh, I saw that. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. Do both of you have cats? Uh, if so, will it be in the Q and A someday? So my cat was actually born underneath the basement or underneath the bathroom in this apartment, but now lives in a far fancier place far away from here where he doesn't have to go outside anymore. So 
he will not be on the stream until I get back, which is going to be about a week. But after that, um, so he's been on the, he's, we've tried to have him on the stream before. He's not very interested in, in more than anything for about three minutes. So unless I want to get scratched, which I don't, uh, you might see a flash of him, but I don't think he'll be long, here long enough to ask a question, unfortunately. We had a, what about your cat? I don't have a cat. My cat's yes. imaginary. Yes. Yeah. He builds his own cat friends. That's true. Um, we had a question about free CAD resources. So one of the YouTube channels that I used to watch, uh, trying to find one of them in particular, but also Free Cat Academy is pretty good. There's this other guy, I think his channel is like Joko Engineering or something like that. I'll find it and uh, dump the links there. But it's basically how I taught myself how to CAD everything I know in Free Cat and also the skills were like transferable to um, SolidWorks and, oh God, what's the other one? Um, yeah, Free Cat's really great. It's open source, it's free. Um, and I started out with these tutorials. It's a really great place to start. Oh, for everybody asking, it was H-A-K-C-A-T dot com, hackat dot com. All right, next question. Uh, oh, Parrot OS or Kali Linux? Uh, you use Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, I'd say Kali. Um, shoot, I forget if it's GNOME, but I really like the default um, windowing system slash like operating system interface. And also the tools are just like, more tailored for what I'm doing. I'm not trying to like use like a crossover operating system that's both for like hacking and desktop stuff at the same time. Honestly, most of the hacking stuff that I need to do, I still do on my like Ubuntu, um, like main driver operating system anyways. But if I do need to do like hacking specific stuff, uh, Kali Linux on a thumb drive is pretty much my go-to. <clears throat> I would, um... I would just say like it really depends on who you are and what you're doing. If you're a beginner, then Kali Linux has more documentation. If you are an advanced user, then Parrot Security OS is beautiful and has more tools. That Pretty would be it. Oh, I found the channel that I was looking for. So if you want to switch over to my screen, I hope this page loads. But um, yeah, so as, as I said, uh, FreeCAD Academy um, is one of them, but also this channel in particular, uh, Joko Engineering has a lot of crazy resources for um, creating basic like beginner stuff all the way to advanced things like this uh, engine block that you can see here or some other advanced uh, kind of models. But yeah, I would recommend checking those out. Um, someone else is asking, what is the most effective Wi-Fi hacking method, the one with the highest, highest success rate? There is no one Wi-Fi hacking method that has higher than about a 40% success rate, but there's like three different types of techniques that have about a 40% success rate. So if you do each one of them in sequence, odds are that you're probably going to get a hit. Um, I don't do them in terms of like which one has the highest, highest success rate. I do them in order of which is the easiest and fastest to do. So for example, like a, um, a pixie dust, like PMK ID attack, like might not be the most successful, but it is the fastest because it only takes about 15 seconds to try. Mm -hmm. So I would almost always try like a PMK ID or like a, a pixie dust attack. Um, and then after that, I would try like a simple brute force attack. And then after that, I would try like a social engineering attack uh, where I would like cut them off from access to their real network and put up a fake one and try to get them to put that in um, all the while trying to brute force their password. Pretty much the same, yeah. Um, in terms of like password lists too, I find generally that like rock you or just like the local like area code seem to work very well. Like uh, just a word list of, you know, um, phone numbers. I have pretty good success with that. Or also there's like uh, just combinations of default credentials that you can use typically for like my spectrum Wi-Fi or like some of those default um, networks that are pretty pretty easy to run through. Yeah, yeah. So it's always good to have like different layers <clears throat> of attacks to run through. Because again, if you're completely relying on like the like pixie dust attack to work and then it doesn't, like, you know, you're kind of screwed if you don't have a backup plan. But if it happens to work, then you'll certainly be glad you tried it because it's going to save you a lot of work trying to brute force what otherwise could be a very difficult password. Yep. Um, how do you hack mobile apps on iOS and Android? Does Burp Suite work and what is needed? I hear a lot of people like Nick was using um, Android like Debug Bridge and Android Studio hmm. um, in order to run like a virtual Android device on their computer and then like load a, a vulnerable application and be able to like access the files and everything else in order to do pen testing. So it's like, 
doing directory traversal and seeing if like files are exposed that shouldn't be, and then like being able to like uh, like type in variables and see where they appear later in the file so you can like extract secrets, like really like sneaky and cool stuff that I didn't really know you could do. And they're some of the worst performing videos we've ever put up. I was like fascinated by them. And like Nick was doing a series of how to get into Android hacking. So I actually definitely check out um, Hack5 is where we did it actually um, for Nick's series on like Android pen testing because it's actually super, super cool. And for just whatever reason performed really, really poorly um, in terms of just like viewership, even though I think it was one of the more interesting pieces we have and probably really helpful for anybody who wanted to get started with that. So yeah, check out our guy Nick on Hack5. Um, he did a really good series on that and it gets you into how to create your own virtual Android device and then start hacking vulnerable applications on them. So nice. really cool and fun. Yeah, I don't know too much about hacking mobile apps. I do have a friend though that dabbles um, in that a little. One interesting thing that he does is he'll look for like exposed API endpoints on like the web app version of certain applications like Twitter or Instagram or stuff like that. Basically apps that have like a counterpart that you can access from like a web browser. Um, and also like look for private API calls and then also like try that like on the mobile app and like find different ways to like crash them, inject like faulty code um, and stuff like that. <clears throat> I'm not too familiar with like the techniques and stuff like that, but I thought that was pretty interesting. What is the most malicious and easiest thing to do people do when they gain access to your Wi-Fi? Things that have real world effects, like waiting till no one is home to rob or uh, something else. Well, okay, so if somebody gets access to your Wi-Fi network um, and you're looking for the easiest thing to do, they're gonna set up like some sort of like VPN endpoint so they can turn around and sell your data connection to people doing credit card scams and other like super high risk activities that are, that are gonna get an IP address blacklisted or the police called on you. Um, so obviously that would be something where you wouldn't want to have suddenly your internet shut off and the FBI show up because 100,000 like fake credit cards went through your Wi-Fi. Um, you know, that would be a pretty bad thing to have happen. Now, if we're talking about like surveillance, then yes, you could absolutely surveil when someone was home or not home. And you could also tell what kind of stuff they have, you know, just driving through a, like a neighborhood and running Kismet will show you every IOT device that that person owns, anything that has a Wi-Fi radio, you can identify that. And it makes it really easy to find everything from uh, like Wi-Fi connected adult items uh, all the way through expensive TVs, and even vehicles with like like uh, like attachments or other things that have Wi-Fi radios too that are very distinctive. So um, yeah, there's a lot you can do with Wi-Fi, but I would still say that the easiest thing to do is just use the resource, repackage it, and sell it to criminals as a VPN endpoint, and let them do all sorts of bad stuff on your Wi-Fi network, and then just let the police figure out afterwards like what happened. Nice. Another person was asking, can you explain WPA3 and management frame protection of, of barriers for hackers? Alex? Uh, <laughs> sort of, kind of. Uh, I mean, management frame protection, as far as I know, that prevents you, that prevents like the typical attack where a hacker can do stuff like deauthentication or like mm -hmm. uh, otherwise like spoofing or injecting arbitrary packets. Um, as for WPA3, there are some interesting encryption protocols that were put into place, like SAE, which is uh, simultaneous authentication of equals, um, which is like something that's correlated to elliptical curve cryptography. Basically, what all that means is like a typical offline hash cracking that you can do with like WPA2. Um, and that kind of thing is completely out of the question with WPA3, since this requires you to um, actively authenticate with an access point. So that means you can't like kick people off the network, sniff like the handshake, and then do offline cracking. Um, which kind of sucks. Is there uh, anything else you would add to that? Yeah. So the big thing that, about WPA3 is the fact that you can do um, that you can do a reasonable job of protecting management frames and preventing spoofing. And that includes also things like beacon frames. So previously, there were a lot of different ways you could mess with beacon frames because they weren't protected. And that meant you could do things like downgrade the speed of, an, of a specific device on a network and do other attacks that are kind of similar to, to deauthentication, but just by spoofing unprotected frames like beacon frames. So by bringing yeah. more of these frames into the fold of encryption, it makes it a lot more difficult for an adversary like us to you know, disconnect you from Wi-Fi, spoof a fake network, try to get your password, try to get a hash of your password, like all that stuff is much more difficult. 
Um, even some of these fundamental attacks using beacon frames that used to be relatively easy are now made more complicated by the fact we can't spoof them as easily. So of course, there's um, degradation attacks that are still available against this. The hash that is being used is relatively more expensive. So that means it's possible to overwhelm an access point with requests and make it so that it basically runs out of computing power and isn't able to function properly. So by degradating um, an access point with an attack like this, you can make it so it defaults back to an earlier version of encryption that is lighter on its processing power, but much easier for an attacker to go after. So some of these downgrade attacks are very, very common attack vectors and make it easier for attackers to just not even deal with the newer security. They'll just do something that, that makes it inconvenient to use and it'll either automatically or manually be reset back to an older version. So yeah, very easy to um, <laughs> kind of make that difficult for people to use, uh, even with some of the existing tools. And it's mostly, again, just like degradation attacks. There's not really any, any deauthentication attacks that are completely out for WPA3. Hi, Cody. I love how you sometimes showcase Raspberry Pis with hacking. Can you recommend a good LTD screen that I can install on a Raspberry Pi with Kali Linux trying to make a portable hacker box. Um, I haven't done I have one a recommendation. For... Please, please, please. Yeah, I haven't uh, done one in too long. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of, they're actually like barely out of reach. I have a bunch of uh, TFP screens that are really nice. Um, those are thin film transistor screens. Adafruit sells a whole bunch that work uh, really nicely. The drivers are readily available and accessible online. You can just search for like 2.8 inch or 3.5 inch. Uh, TFT screens, I'd recommend the ones from Adafruit. Those were uh, pretty great. And also, um, Waveshare is another brand that has some pretty good um, small compact screens that you can slap on there. Most of them work over GPIO using uh, like a weird frame buffer thing. But if you want to use like a mini HDMI one, Waveshare also has some of those as well. So I'd recommend you check that out. Oh, yeah. Somebody was also asking um, where they can put in the comment for the stickers uh, if they're buying a shirt. I don't know. I thought you were going to buy a nugget. Um, the On the shirts, it doesn't look like there is one. So you'll have to be creative in getting us that message because um, this is not an official giveaway. I'm just trying to help you out, my Irish friends. I'm We're also both half from, from Ireland. So we're just trying to you know, send some nuggets back to the old country or something. Yeah. All right. Next question. Oh, yeah. Someone says, I love how Alex, that's me. Oh, yeah, that's you. Yeah, that is me. Does KiCad projects. Can we have some nice harder <clears throat> projects, please? Yeah, it's been a while since I've been able to work on anything new. Um, but I actually just started working on a mini PCB prototype, specifically for the DNS exfiltration thing I was talking about earlier. So hopefully as a follow-up video after um, our flagship video comes out, I'm going to be making like a little DIY build guide with a small little uh, circuit board. Um, somebody is asking us about I and E um, e learning. Never, I have literally never seen that before until this moment. But I'm interested now that I can see that it has uh, online labs and stuff. But um, we neither of us have any certifications. Um, we are both specialists. I am specialist in Wi-Fi. If you ask me about like some other general security concept, I might not be as well educated as somebody with a cert because they would have to do much more general work than me. But, um, you know, and Alex is more of like a prototyping person with other very specific knowledge in cybersecurity. So neither of us have certifications. We might not be the best one to point you towards that just because, um, yeah, I've never seen this, but it does look cool. Nice. Yeah, I never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks real fancy, though. I like that site. And that makes me think it's expensive, yeah. which is why I would want to say that, oh, pricing and plans, whatever. I'm not going to I'm not going to embarrass them. Oh, OK, that is a oh, lot. Though. Yeah. 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 Maybe my boss can pay for that. Not me, though. All right, next question. Do you guys use Docker for anything? Ah, yeah. you can thank our good friend Brandon at Google for that. Yeah, um, Docker is great. I do use <laughs> Docker. Okay, Docker is a fine tool. It That's is. as far as I'll go. It's great. What don't you like about it? Um, I don't know the setup process, how much time it took me to fix it, how difficult it is to get working on a Mac OS system, how little support there was on a Mac OS system, how much time it took overall to even find the problem on a Mac OS system, the end result of installing it on a Mac OS system, the fact that even after installing it, it still didn't work. And I had to open the application and have it running in the background, which nothing said you had to. Should I go on? Uh, no, if you were using Linux, this wouldn't be a problem. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Linux, this would not have happened, says yeah. my sticker. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so 
Docker is fine. Once you get it up and running, it's fine. Um, and once you deal with the sometimes spotty documentation for using it, for example, on Mac OS, it's also fine. But what do we use it for, Alex? <laughs> um, I usually use it. Well, actually, we do use it for some of the projects on our like Hatcat GitHub, specifically like the USB Nugget page and stuff. Like we use that it for, for development. Version, yeah, version yeah. We use it for our stuff. software development. Is is yeah. what I was going for. Yeah. I use it on pretty much like all my repos now. Like, it's great. Yeah. So um, one thing that's really nice about Docker is the fact that when we have a distributed team like we do, like not everybody is here and they have to recreate like a bunch of very specific stuff in order to make a build for our project. We decided that it would be better for everybody to be able to uh, check things and have automatic like tests and stuff. And that's, you kind of need to use Docker like once you start doing programming like that. So that's why we've been using it. And um, so far it's been tolerable. What are your opinions on the ESP32 chips from Express? from Espresso and others for prototyping and proof of concept hardware. It's great, although they're going crazy with the naming convention. There's a whole bunch of different variations of the ESP32. I've worked with, I think, three or four of them just in the past like two weeks alone. Um, so specifically, we use the ESP32 S2 on our USB Nugget boards because that supports Wi-Fi um, and also native USB so we can do like keystroke injection and that kind of thing. I believe the S3 also supports those features and also has Bluetooth, kind of maybe. Haven't really worked with that. Um, the original ESP32 <laughs> is a little bit weird, um, but I actually started working with it because there does seem in a limited capacity to be research on using that chipset for doing Wi Fi attacks. Uh, just the other week, I was testing out like the authentication. Uh, full handshake capture, which is something that was previously not possible on the, um, like the precursor to this, which is the ESP8266, um, like PMKID capture, that kind of thing. Um, so that's really cool. Generally, I'd say the ESP32 is, I'd say it's the most ubiquitous and also like powerful, like low cost IoT microcontroller you're going to find out there. My favorite is the S2 right now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great piece of hardware. If we switch over to my screen, you can see the main website where they list all the different espresso chips. And like Alex said, a lot of them have come out recently. We currently use the ESP32 S2, um, which, as you can see, has a lot of really great features. But the most important is... Um, I don't know if it's screen sharing. Oh. That's, I think it's sharing the other browser, maybe. That's weird. Um, OK, well, I'll just bring it over on the other browser then, unless it's frozen. Hmm. Maybe it is. Yes. It is. It is frozen, but yeah. that's fun. Um, do you want to pull up the espresso page? Yeah. Just, Yes, that's the espresso chip list. Um, but yeah, so uh, we use the ESP32 S2, um, and uh, it is got it's got native USB on it. The ESP32 S3 also has native USB, but it also has Bluetooth, which is really exciting. And that's something that we've been looking at using as a way of maybe in the future having something like a like a smartphone application that's able to communicate with our product, which would be really awesome. I do wonder if they. Because on the regular ESP32, it also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but there's the issue where you couldn't like use both simultaneously because it's connected to the same antenna. I wonder if they fixed that though, because that's really annoying. Yeah, yeah, it would be it would be really annoying. Um, we have the ESP32C series. I don't really like these ones as much because they don't have a uh, native uh, USB, which makes yeah. it kind of a bummer to communicate with. Um, Adafruit does have some boards with this, and you can use it with Circuit Python, which is cool. But like again, like I just I don't know why these are cool. I don't know why I like them. Um, ESP32 C3, these are the RISC V ones. Sounds cool, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, but again, no USB as far as I can see. So that makes it a little bit less useful. But hey, it's RISC V, so that's cool if you like RISC V stuff. Um, they have the C6 series. This is again RISC V. Um, Bluetooth. Wi Fi 6, though. Yeah. Kick ass. Wi Fi 6, it's yes. The first dual band like, Wi Fi microcontroller by them. Yeah. Which is really, really awesome. So like that's another thing that we're looking forward to. Again, like it doesn't look like it supports like the authentication or anything crazy out of the box, but we're looking at how that would be possible in the future. Um, and then there's the original ESP32 series. So yeah, there are indeed a lot of different espresso chips out there. As uh, people that work with these very often, like I highly recommend you check some of these out, out and compare the features because there's um, in Arduino or other programming languages, a lot of support for these and uh, they're pretty cool to work with. Um, I recently tried to install the like the underlying like espresso IDF and found it to be even worse than Docker to install. Uh, it still doesn't work. Um, so yeah, it is a little bit difficult programming these on a very low level. But if you want to use a higher le level kind of extra abstracted programming language, there's great support for these in Arduino IDE if that's something that you're comfortable with. 
would an ARP scan or net discover be discovered or net discover be flagged by an SOC? And all, are there alternatives to NMAP to discover ports that the Uber hacker, for example, may have used so far as to not be detected? Okay, um, I used to work at an office for like uh, as a contractor at Uber, and I was directly connected to their network and running ARP scans almost continuously, just because I am who I am. And like, you know, you connect me to a network, I want to know who I, who I can talk to. Um, so I was able to ARP scan like everything and nobody ever talked to me. So from my direct personal experience, I can say, no, I don't think that, um, I don't think it got flagged or if it did get flagged, nobody ever said anything to me about it. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, being, <laughs> that being said, those are like the two most used tools, um, that I use for like port scanning, that kind of thing. Uh, I usually use net discover to initially discover like devices on the network. Uh, sometimes I'll run like a UPnP scan or something like that. And then use nmap to like follow up to see open ports on those devices um of course these are like a little bit noisy i'm not sure about what they're other, very noisy yeah what other tools there are um but yeah to answer the there, question but... yes it, uh, uh like a security sock should oh, yeah. pick up stuff like this and identify it as like suspicious behavior and try to like track down like why did this happen like what is this person supposed to be doing this on the corporate network why are they you know trying to find out what other devices here and what ports are they looking for right. like that's really important yeah. so if you're doing a scan and it's like looking for like a like a sketchy port or something then like yeah you're gonna you are doing a very noisy attack that everybody on the network can see and it does not look like normal traffic yeah the other week when i was actually getting these exact business cards printed uh, for a usb nugget um I connected to like the guest network of the place that I was waiting at because they didn't have my cards ready and they said they'd have them like printed in 30 minutes. So I was just like tooling around on the network. Um, the guest network that I was allowed to connect to, I just ran like a basic scan and found that not only was the network not segmented to like all the personal computers that were there, but they had like entire print machines with default credentials connected to the guest network, uh, remote desktop protocol um, and default creds for SSH, uh, file transfer and like, um, vnc on like all their machines just like there and i was i didn't connect to any of them but um yeah <laughs> it's scary what you can discover hmm. sorry i'm reading through some questions some somebody got an esp32 c3 and they were saying it was like a lot faster than some of the dual core ones maybe hmm. because they're risk five yeah a lot of people are really um really interested in the risk five uh, like in like architecture uh, because it allows much more freedom like you can see all of it it's not proprietary but there were i think there were some complaints about like proprietary like firmware blobs or something i don't know like um i don't but... like too much into it honestly like all the esp chipsets have also been 32-bit for the longest time hmm. i couldn't imagine that like most of the stuff that like we're doing at least in the in the scope and scale of like our projects that like it would make a huge difference but there are more supports for like libraries and that architecture that are already out there so it is cool to see that they're supporting that. Um, one question is playing with the Marauder type of device. So we've uh, had a Marauder, an ESP32 Marauder on the stream before, and it is a really interesting way of solving the problem of one microcontroller being able to do Wi-Fi attacks and one being able to do like handshake attacks, but not both. So there's two different ways around that. Either you do a bunch of rever reverse engineering and try to figure out like how to get one chip to do both, or you can just slap both of them onto a micro or onto a PCB and then you kind of solve the problem if one can communicate with the other. So the Marauder that we have is an amalgam of the ESP32 and the ESP8266 just kind of combined together in order to do both type of attacks. And it's an interesting device. Um, we've covered it before though, and I'm not sure if anything else or new has come out for it. So if you know anything cool that has come out for it, then please let us know. That was cool. The question is, were you talking about the Marauder? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right all right um is parallels worth buying um that's a great question if you have one of the new macbooks and you need to do virtualization then i would say probably yes just just for that one reason because they seem to be some of the earliest uh like commercial solutions for running like a virtual machine and not having an absolutely terrible time um, so that would be my recommendation is if you're going to be running virtual machines a lot and you're on a newer Mac OS computer that's, you know, running on like the special silicon, then like you should, you should maybe consider it. Otherwise, um, I think there's always alternatives that could be better, frankly. Um, 
but I will say that they are super convenient if you need to run a virtual machine on a, a new like Mac OS right now. Cody, talk to us. This is for you. Okay. How do you guys feel about the NVIDIA situation? You hear about Intel and their ARC. Um, I don't know much. Intel's about building an ARC? <laughs> wow. I guess, are they based we'll in Florida? Be with Noah's ARC. Okay. Uh, well, that is, uh, no, sorry. I don't know anything about that. Um, I'll have to look it up for the news. I did see later. some pretty clickbaity, like Linus tech tip things about NVIDIA and like Intel recently. So I'm not sure if this is like a recent development, but I don't yeah. know much about that either. Yeah. I've been like, sorry, I've been like watching like the war in Ukraine and like the pipeline stuff. Like I haven't gotten around to like NVIDIA. Um, do you offer private lessons for a fee? We have um, classes that we actually do in Los Angeles. Alex, it's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to switch over to my screen, this is a class that I'm going to be doing in a week and a half. So this is, um, so I've been running these like introduction to keystroke injection and USB attack workshops as like a basically a beginner introduction that uses our very own cat shaped board, the Nugget. Um, some people were interested in some more advanced hacking techniques like data exfiltration and uh, enumeration, scanning, that kind of thing. So this is a more advanced, I'd say like intermediate to advanced workshop where I'll cover some interesting like remote attack payloads, uh, data exfiltration, like remote hacking over Wi-Fi and that kind of thing. Um, so if you guys are interested and in the LA area, you can check out this link, which I'll drop in the chat in just a second here. But two different price tiers. If you're completely new to this, you can just buy a nugget at the door. If you already have a nugget, you can get a discounted ticket for about half the price. And I'm also going to be running more of these in the future as well. So um, these are sort of like a bring your own nugget event or buy one if you so please. Um, I wanted to also reach back to the person who was asking about like other scanning te techniques. Like there are purely passive scanning techniques um, that wouldn't be detected where you're just listening for connections across the network and noting every single one that happens. Like Wireshark is able to do that, to do that for example. Um, so there are completely passive methods that I didn't mm -hmm. mention. Uh, that aren't actually yeah. scans. They're just like accumulating data that you see on the network as it comes in. And they're because you're not really transmitting anything, it means that it would be impossible to be detected. Um, Stanley says, I don't live in LA. I live in the matrix. What about Zoom? Whoa. Um, yes. Yeah, so one thing is uh, we have a many full, well, like, all right. So we have many full-time projects. We have a show that we do. We have our own product that we've launched. We do classes. We do videos every week. Um, we don't do a lot of consulting. So if you have like a highly specific technical problem that's going to require more than like an hour of our time, like the odds are like we're not the ideal consultants just because like we're on our own stuff right now. Um, if you have a problem that like intersects with like one of the things we're working on, like if you are dying to find a great educational like tool to teach uh, cybersecurity and you need a bunch of them, then like, hey, well, guess what? We happen to be manufacturing a bunch of them right now because that's what, that's what we're doing. But if you have like... <clears throat> A very specific problem that has nothing to do with that probably not going to be unavailable unfortunately because we do a lot all of the time so um yes just a little note about that <clears throat> um do you have preferred devices or just usb add-ons for your penetration testing hmm i'm not sure i understand the question um so yeah for, like hardware devices like uh like, like hack five years a place to start yeah, so like uh, if you're looking, so if you're talking about just like what kind of standard gear would I bring to a pen test, like it's all, for me, it's going to be mostly like Wi Fi stuff. Everything from like, um, yeah, everything from like really powerful like Wi Fi antennas for surveillance um, all the way up through like super small like Wi Fi prototype devices for like implants. Because um, that's a lot of what I do. So like yeah. um, my bag, I have just like a little like container that just says cyber and you open it and it's like a bunch of really nice Adafruit boards and then like a bunch of super, super terrible, virtually untraceable, like the cheapest stuff you can buy microcontrollers like all laid out and then like a bunch of wires and breadboards for connecting them. So like I have a little prototyping kit that like looks, uh, it gets flagged by TSA like every time, uh, but it's something that I can build these helpful little like uh, like prototypes if I need to for like a Wi-Fi engagement because um, that's mostly what I specialize in. Yeah, I wish I had mine on me, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll show it off on the next stream. I have like this little go bag that I have that has like a whole assortment of different dongles. I have like some generic like Logitech ones. I have an assortment of Wi-Fi dongles. I also now have an Ubertooth, a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is like loaded with Kali. So if I wanted to SSH into it and do like some Wi-Fi stuff, I can do that. Um, a Bash Bunny, Shark Jack, uh, some other Hack 5 gear as well. 
And then also prototyping stuff as well. That's really important. Greetings from Germany. Uh, from Germany. Hello. Uh, sorry. Hello. Um, thanks for your content. What you guys outside the IT world? I believe you meant what do you guys do outside the IT world? Uh, and we only do a little bit of IT, so I guess you mean cybersecurity. Um, I like to do urban exploration and uh, find street art in storm drain tunnels. Alex? I like to sleep and also occasionally hurt myself, like this nasty scar that I just got quite recently from skating. Through, oh, yeah, so skating. Yeah. yeah. As well as some other random stuff. How many programming languages known to the Alex? All of them. <laughs> That's not true. I know of a lot of them. How many do I actually know how to code in? Not a lot. Probably like five. Which ones? Oh. Uh, it wasn't how... <laughs> Uh, let's see, Python, basic, C++, C Sharp, a little bit of Perl, uh, I guess bash scripting, I, I don't think that really counts. Um, I know a little bit of Java, not so much. I actually hate Java. I wouldn't count like web dev stuff as like programming, but that's, that's about it. Uh, all right, here's one. I assume data expo is not as simple as sending an email to yourself with all the company info or uploading it to a cloud. Is it uh, about sneaking it out in a way that doesn't appear suspicious in the logs? Yes. Um, so one of my favorite cybersecurity memes is like, someone's like, we've been breached. And the CEO is like, how do you know? And then like the resulting image is just like a 60 gigabyte DNS traffic log. And they're like, all right, well, yeah, that's not good. Like 60 gigabytes should not have been going out over DNS like that should absolutely never happen. That's a file transfer is what that is. That's 60 gigabyte file transfer. And that is a huge problem. And that really does happen uh, because sure, a company might be looking for like suspicious email attachments or other things within their predefined like, like office environment or something like that. But they might not be looking for these DNS requests or other things that could slip through depending on if they're crafted properly. So playing a cat and mouse game between like a SOC and then like, uh, you know, pre-written rules, firewalls, like. Uh, that is kind of the way this has worked for a very long time. And being able to sneak out data, if you're doing something like double exfiltration ransomware, where you want to encrypt the data, but you also want to be able to send a certain amount of it back to yourself and threaten to leak it if they don't pay you, that does require you to sneak the data out. And you can't exactly just upload it to like a file server most of the time. Although sometimes it really is as easy as that. So yeah, DNS exfiltration is super popular. Can you think of any other ways? Um... I mean, there are, there's a whole bunch of yeah. request exfiltration and various different form factors. I don't know. DNS is definitely the most popular. Um, yeah. If you're able to like physically compromise, there's also ways you could do that as well, um, obviously. like One of my favorites being the recent uh, keystroke reflection attack that was unveiled by Hack5. I think that one's pretty cool, um, which basically uses like toggling on and off the caps lock key with a keystroke injection device as a way of bit banging information over to a flash drive. Um, there's also some particularly interesting like side channel uh, data exfiltration techniques that I was reading into from uh, this guy, Mordecai Guru. Uh, he basically showcases like a whole bunch of unconventional ways that you could do like data exfiltration using peripherals on computers. One of them was called Satan, which is like SATA N. And basically it uses the cable that runs from like a SATA drive inside of a computer um, to transmit data wirelessly over six gigahertz since um, the communication speed with the hard drive is able to like toggle it on and off at a rate that allows the wire to act as like a transmitter. So basically this technique like used a hard drive to transmit data wirelessly for exfiltration. There's also some other pretty cool ones that use like ethernet LED indicators on the back of a computer to like bit bang and like flash out a code that you can like take a video of on your phone and then decode later. There's a whole bunch of really, really weird ways that you can do these like kind of covert side channel attacks in order to bypass um, sophisticated detection methods. Hmm. Um, I'd say like physical like hardware exploits are definitely the most interesting to me. Um, so one question that I don't know the answer to, no, that's me, I guess. Um, you ever use the Omega? Sorry, not trying to spam, just looking for answers. Um, I don't know what that is. Can you be more specific? Um, I don't think I, I don't think I have, um, though, but, uh, yeah. Okay. So we're actually just about out of time. I'll try to answer that question if he gets it in in time. 
If your question didn't get answered today and you have a really good one, or if you're watching this on repeat, make sure to leave your question on the YouTube video so we can answer it next week. Uh, we always make sure to look through and find uh, questions that have been left. So uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, you can always, well, sorry, if you have any ideas for future episodes or anything, you can hit me up on Twitter. And of course, thank you to our sponsor, Veronis, for allowing us to do this every week and getting to hang out with all of you. Um, yeah. All right, we'll take one last question. Um, what are some of your failed attempts, whether you got caught or just could not get in? Um, I would consider, yeah, I would consider getting suspended for unscrewing my laptop uh, a failed attempt. I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to dual boot um, Ubuntu on my restricted school laptop. This is actually the exact same model, um, but basically, I did a thing that I wasn't supposed to, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, like that's so, that's so bad." And you're trying to hack this computer, and then I got two week suspension, <laughs> um, which is pretty stupid. I didn't even do anything. Wow. Yeah, I okay. I think that that's good enough that we can count that that yeah. question as answered. How about you? Uh, not as good as that. No. Okay. All right. So that's all we have time for today. If you want to uh, check us out next week, we will be here same time on the Hack Five channel as well as on the Security Forward channel, and then on Wednesday or sorry, no, on Friday we usually do the news stream. But I am going to be in the middle of nowhere um, on the way back from here. So uh, yeah, we'll probably skip the Friday news stream this Friday, but make sure to check out the Security Forward channel where we do the night news stream every other Friday, and you can catch us live there too. All right, see you guys next time. Bye.